It was six in the morning. I got a knock on my door, a really loud knock, and I thought it was my dad who had locked himself out or something. So I opened it and it's the LED flashlights and the really obnoxious bulletproof vest and the dragging me out into the cold when I'm in my pajamas. That was not fun. They seemed pretty shocked by the sarcastic, belligerent, angry teenager that they dragged out of bed that day. <laughs> I don't know if it's just that I was 19 or that I was a girl, but they didn't expect this. Ten thousand angry kids, whoever they are, they scared the shit out of some people those days. They scared the shit out of the powers that be. And that's why this is being investigated. That's why I'm under indictment. That's it. Because between the days of December 6th and December 10th, 10,000 angry people proved to the government that their regulations, their ideas, their view of PayPal, their view of WikiLeaks, their view of the Afghan war, and Egypt, and Tunisia, and Libya, it didn't fucking matter. Their opinion no longer mattered because someone was out on the internet kicking ass. The computer hacker group Anonymous is claiming tonight that it took down the website of the Federal Appeals Court in San Francisco this afternoon. They took down Senate.gov servers. They've taken down H.B. Gary. Sony's claiming they did $150 million worth of damage. So many confidential files that tonight, because of these hackers, can be in the hands of anyone. Visa, MasterCard, the PayPal situation. See criminals who hacked into Sarah Palin's private email. The Church of Scientology says Anonymous is a cyber terrorist group of religious bigots. Anonymous and this other group called a Lulz Sec. They seem to be wanting to prove a point. Anonymous kind of was like the big, strong, buff kid who had low self-esteem. And then all of a sudden, punched somebody in the face and was like, holy shit, I'm really strong. And Anonymous calls itself the final boss of the internet. And sometimes it proves to be really fucking true. You are going to violate the freedoms of the internet, you certainly better watch the fuck out. They are kind of the rude boys of activism. There's a real rough edge to them, which I think also is one reason why they garner so much love and hate from people, too. They represent a certain sort of chaotic freedom. Individual, young, nameless, faceless folks are having geopolitical impact. I mean, it's, it's, it's both exhilarating to realize that and terrifying to realize that. It kind of depends on how that power is wielded. We are legion. We do not forget. Expect us. We stand for freedom. We stand for freedom of speech, the power of the people, the ability for them to protest against the government, to right wrongs. No censorship, especially online, but also in real life. We have members throughout society and all stratas of it worldwide. Yeah, we have no leadership. It's a one voice. It's, it's not individual voices. That's why we don't show our faces. That's why we don't give our names. We're speaking as one, and it's a collective. Good timing. I would love to live in a country where the government fears its citizens and not, and, and not the other way around. But right now, Plenty of anonymous actors are in hiding because of fear of reprisals by the government. I've been called many things. There's unpatriotic. That we're just a bunch of children sitting in some our parents' basement. I got called a terrorist sympathizer. We've been called kids, we've been called cyber bullies, we've been called hooligans, and you know, sometimes those words aren't entirely unfair, but this is a serious political movement. No one, you know, in the general public really seems to get it. What they don't seem to get is that the ability for Anonymous to be everything and anything is, is, is its power. 
Anonymous is a series of relationships, hundreds and hundreds of people uh, who are very active in it and who have varying skill sets and who have varying issues they want to advance and uh, who are collaborating in different ways each day. They're a little bit like a prism or a kaleidoscope. They've got many different facets and many different sides. Of course, when you spend enough time with them, you start to get a sort of feel or texture um, that's not just random, right? Yet it's very multifaceted, very rich, does, which does span from the quite lighthearted to the very, very serious. Bob Dylan had a line in a song to saying, to live outside the law, you must be honest. They might do something which isn't technically correct, maybe it's not legally correct, but they're doing it for purposes that in their minds at least are ethical. People who know what they're doing, who share an ethos, who have a commitment to exposing and humiliating the man, who have a very low tolerance of um, lies and uh, what they perceive as uh, evil on the part of overweening power structures. They share information, they share tools and techniques, and they uh, are currently having a very good time. The hacker culture, as we know it, uh, really sprang from one place. It, it was MIT, and it was uh, uh, specifically the people in the uh, Model Railroad Club, the Tech Model Railroad Club. Hacking originated as humorous pranks. When the guys at MIT put a Volkswagen up on top of the dome of the building, uh, and people woke up and saw the car up there in the morning. Uh, or they uh, measured a bridge by the body lengths of somebody. I would say his name was Brian, and discovered the bridge over the Charles River was, you know, 822 Brians. Uh, these are funny things. That's where hacking originated, and it migrated into engineering and uh, computer communities. Uh, it's witty. It's pranks. Basically, Microsoft and Apple both got their entire start off computer crime. Bill Gates stole pretty much all of MS-DOS, Steve, you know, Jobs. He was creating boxes to defraud the phone company, you know. I always saw hacking as implicitly political. But hackers, whether they're conscious about it or not, whether they're explicit about it or not, make a statement about how we should treat information. And some years after my, my book came out, uh, one of the people I wrote about, Richard Stallman, got very publicly and explicitly political about open software. About you know, He believed that software should be free. Free as in freedom, not free as in beer, uh, as, as, as he put it there. Behind it, whether misguided or not, there's a political impulse. Hacktivism was a term coined by a group called Cult of the Dead Cow. The Loft had an interesting relationship with the Cult of the Dead Cow. We've actually, there was three members that were in both organizations. And we kind of kept like the serious security research that they were doing, they would do under the Loft name. And if they were doing some sort of just goofy stunt-like things, they would do it under the Cult of the Dead Cow name. Because the Cult of the Dead Cow was really kind of um, a, sort of like a propaganda type of organization. They had a guy who was the minister, minister of propaganda. They're kind of merry pranksters. Like, everything they did was completely over the top. You know, they would dress up like Mr. T sometimes. They would do rap songs at DEF CON, like a rap performance. One of the guys there, uh, I think his name was T Fish, for short for Tweety Fish, coined the term hacktivism because he saw what his, one of the things his group was doing, which he called hacktivism, was writing software that people in other countries could use to communicate securely, even if their government was spying on them. So the principle was really, it was freedom of expression. It was everyone should have access to the internet. Everyone should be able to communicate and get their message out on the internet. Even more important in countries where there was repressive regimes, that if you said something against the regime, they would come and take you away and you weren't saying it anymore. A good place to start are with what has often been called virtual sit-ins which use the tactic of a denial of service attack. Denial of service has been around for a long, long time. The equivalent of like, if you, you know, for some reason wanted to disrupt a, a bus service, right? You can hire a thousand extras to all go and like line up at the bus station, right? And get on the bus. And so then anyone who was really trying to get on the bus couldn't do it, right? It's as simple as that. When you stop trying to visit, website goes back up, no permanent damage. And this tactic has been used by a number of different groups. Um, 
Probably the most famous is the Electronic Disturbance Theater. Another really interesting case happened in Germany where a group of activists got together who wanted to protest the fact that the airline Lufthansa was using, they were using their planes to deport immigrants and they would take down the site. And in fact, eventually the German courts ruled that this was a legitimate form of protest. From airport security to subway bag checks, there's no question it's a new world post 9-11. It's worse now for humans post 9-11 because intrusion and surveillance, which is always going to be misused by those who can misuse it, um, uh, has created a, a different kind of society in which freedom Freedom to move unobserved is a privilege only of the rich. Privacy is a privilege only of the rich. Hackers see the technology giving them sanction to buy that privileged exclusion as well. Intrinsic to the technology is the power to uh, self-transcend and get out of the hump of the bell curve and, and move forward to a par with the masters of society and do battle with them on an equal level playing field. That's activism. Anonymous grew out of what's known as 4chan. And essentially, this is just a, a website where people can upload images uh, and you don't actually give your name. It's just sort of anonymous. When you look at 4chan, you're often surprised because it looks like a site from like 1995 or something. Um, the idea is very simple. You post a comment and you post a picture. Um, and you can post under your name or, or anonymously and it's separated into boards about particular topics. So there's topic on anime, there's topic on uh, weaponry. There's like a 4chan board for origami and you just upload interesting pictures of origami. And then there was a, a group called the B, the B board, which essentially was for like anything goes. The first time anybody goes on B, it's kind of an instant revulsion. Because uh, there's never a time that you go on there where you don't see something horrible. That instantly puts off a lot of people. The idea is post something that can never be unseen. Half of the posts on B are there specifically to make people not want to come back to B. Have you ever read Lord of the Flies? 4chan and especially B is Lord of the Flies. Except some of them aren't 16 anymore, they're just allowed to act 16. It's what you get when people are allowed to express themselves with absolutely no restrictions whatsoever. It's the kind of sum of human imagination when people can get together and think together without any limits or parameters. It's the most vile, disgusting, and funny thing uh, on the internet. Chan was founded by Chris Moot Poole when he was very young, maybe 15, in the early 2000s. He started 4chan because he was a big fan of uh, Japanese animation. Chris Moot Poole is the sweetest kid you've ever met in your life. He's small and he's like, he's got these sort of like tiny features and he runs the most disgusting website in the world. What I think is really Intriguing about a community like 4chan is just that it's, it's this open place. As I said, it's raw, it's unfiltered, and uh, sites like it are, are kind of going the way of the dinosaur right now. They're, they're endangered because we're moving towards uh, social networking, we're moving towards persistent identity, we're moving towards, um, you know, a lack of privacy, really. The B board, that's the exact opposite of Facebook. Facebook, like, you're supposed to be, like, who you are, and, you know, there's sort of one model, which is that, like, you're friends with people, right? In 4chan, you're totally anonymous nobody. And anonymous speech is, a lot of it's ugly, but um, not all of it is, right? It is actually sort of a place where people can be honest. One of the important things about 4chan is to have a thread that really explodes and lasts for a long time. If it doesn't, then it disappears. It's a site that's not archived. So it creates conditions for anything that grabs attention at some level. And so humor and grotesqueness as a result are quite good for that. I'd rather just be referred to as anonymous, I guess, in, in the interviews, because 
I have some docs out on me. Fortune is just where I went to. I grew up on it and I, I lived there. That's just what I did for fun. It takes a thick skin to enjoy it. But, you know, as long as you're not offended, you'll occasionally come into something really cool or really creative on 4chan. I think the most interesting thing about it is how you can watch memes evolve. You'll see something posted one day, and then a week later, it's got 50,000 derivatives of it. A meme is basically just an idea. It's kind of like a gene, but in the realm of the idea. A lot of the, the great internet memes that, that we all know and love, you know, uh, lol cats, right? You know, little cats doing funny things, and then they have, you know, uh, I can has cheeseburger, right? All that stuff seems to start in this, like, Petri dish that is 4chan B-board. And your insane chocolate rain. Name a, any meme from the last about six years, and I'll bet you either in its first posting ever was on 4chan, or at least one of its earliest revisions that became what it was was on 4chan. I can see the food situation is so we'll be on our way. It's basically the best breeding ground for. Uh, internet culture, and as far as I'm concerned, with your neighborhood insurance rates, chocolate rain. 4chan is also very known for acts of trolling. Trolling is a fucking art. Trolling is getting a, the person you're talking to to get as pissed off as they possibly can, and for no reason except for your own enjoyment. Maybe you're trying to illustrate a point, but it's mostly for your own enjoyment. For them, it's, it's funny that like people think the internet is serious business. And if people think the internet is serious business, it's a troll's job to make their life terrible. The idea of anonymous came initially as a joke. I mean, uh, somebody suggested that what if the whole site, what if 4chan, what if B was just one person? And what if that's just one guy called anonymous sitting somewhere and you're just reading all these posts by one guy? And it kind of looks like that from the outsider's perspective. I mean, there's no way to tell the difference. It might as well be one guy. Fox News did a very famous segment about it. They call themselves anonymous. They are hackers on steroids, treating the web like a real-life video game, sacking websites, invading MySpace accounts, disrupting innocent people's lives. And if you fight back, watch out. Destroy. Die. Attack. Threats from a gang of computer hackers calling themselves Anonymous. I've had seven different passwords and they've got them all so far. Anonymous hacked his site and plastered it with gay sex pictures. His girlfriend left him. She thought that, that I was cheating on her with guys. As long as I can think back, Anonymous have done some pretty off-color things in the name of getting cheap laughs, you know. But, I mean, that's part of the culture. They get what they call lulls. Lulls is a corruption of L-O-L, -L, which stands for laugh out loud. <laughs> Anonymous gets big lulls from pulling random pranks. For example, messing with online children's games like Habbo Hotel. Habbo Hotel was this online community where you had an avatar and you walked around and talked to other people. It was kind of like an early... Uh, version of you know World of Warcraft or Second Life or any of those virtual worlds. What the the people on B did was invade, have a hotel, created you know thousands of avatars. They they all had this one uniform of a black guy with a big afro wearing a black suit, and so they there would be thousands of these people, black guys, black suit, you know huge afro walking around this world, and they would do things like form a swastika out of themselves. And I think that was a real landmark because it, it was when they were able to see that, you know, they can use their numbers to do something really interesting and really disruptive. So we blocked the entrance to their pool and that just pissed them off so fucking much. It was fucking beautiful. That was fucking just wonderful, wonderful times. Those kids love that pool. They love the shit out of their pool. The goal was actually to offend everyone, simply because the idea that we could offend you by drawing a little shape on the screen was was stupid to the people involved in it. They were like, really, you're gonna get that mad over us doing, just drawing this on the screen? Wow, well, you, you need to refocus a little on life because this should not be upsetting you that much. 
Barrett Brown. I'm the director of Project PM and uh, former operative with Anonymous. We were targeting furries, which may or a subculture of people, of course, who, you know, a lot of people unfortunately find irritating by virtue of their being irritating. A furry is someone, generally a male who's autistic in his 20s, who identifies with animals and oftentimes has sexual attraction to other people dressed as animals. There's diaper furs, furs who enjoyed wearing diapers, baby furs who enjoyed thinking themselves as a baby. We had furry infiltrators, people trying, you know, we had secret groups, you know, mine was called the, the Illuminati slash I slash Illuminati, and you know, we were, you know, our goal was to wreak as much havoc as possible because it was stupid. There's a, a point, you know, when I was, you know, other, otherwise, you know, seemingly respect, respectable writer, you know, 2007, um, you know, my first book had come out like that, but I spent my evenings on Second Life, that big, you know, virtual world, riding around in a virtual spaceship with the words faggery daggery do written on it, wearing afros, and dropping virtual bombs on little villages and concerts, and waving giant penises around. And that was the most fun time I've ever had in my life. All these different organizations online, whether it's 4chan or just any, any website, there's typically a community uh, aspect to it. This is where people have their social uh, relationships. This is where their friends are. This is where they have a creative outlet. And so all those aspects are going into groups like Anonymous, where people feel like they're part of a bigger thing and they're able to express themselves within that group. There were certain, uh, certain words, certain phrases, uh, certain ways people respond to things, certain images that are posted that created a pattern, and that pattern was, I guess, the origin of what is now anonymous. It's like Freemasons with a sense of humor, and so much as they have this common symbology, and, and one of their chief joys, which is kind of wrapped up in power and secrecy, was the fact that they could recognize each other by referencing these symbols, referencing these phrases. Over 9,000. It's over 9,000! I lost my iPod, mudkips, anything involving mudkips. So you have this weird sort of international culture developing with people you know, across the world, wherever they may be. In late 06 and you know, into early 07, there's a bit of a sea change where instead of just posting a bunch of content or randomly saying we're going to go over to some website and post a bunch of dirty comments against someone, uh, it becomes a little more organized. Welcome to the Hal Turner Show. They went after a guy named Hal Turner. I am being discriminated against because I'm white. Hal Turner was a, was a neo-Nazi who was, you know, big online and had a, like a podcast. I think that the 14th Amendment was not ratified properly, and I think, therefore, it is still okay to have Negroes as slaves in America. The first time I heard about Hal Turner is he was knocking somebody on 4chan. He was just being a major dick to a relatively known user. And for the fun of it, we started trolling him. And then I guess we kind of figured we had a moral high ground, which allowed us to get people on our side. But he was a fucking neo-Nazi. That's not okay to be in modern society. You're not allowed to do that. And there's a million neo-Nazis out there. But he started picking on our dudes, so we had to go to our dude's fucking defense, and it just so happened that he was a neo-Nazi, so that's a big reason that he's a fucking dick face. I'm like, yeah, screw that racist son of a bitch. Let's, let's do this, you know? So I joined in, and I made some of the phone calls, and, you know, I, I played around on, on the chat thing on his website and posted in the threads and whatnot. Who are you? Where are you calling from? Hola, this is Pedro. Spick, don't call, Diego. don't call my radio show anymore, you filthy spick animal. Uh, the college that Higher I go on the to Turner show. has begun an integration program where they try and purposely lower standards to bring more blacks and quote unquote diversify the campus. And by the end of the by the end of uh, the next five years, they intend to bring over nine thousand. He was just a horribly racist radio personality who seemed to handle it well when you called in. Like he could handle being berated by anonymous, and that made it very interesting. It made it a bit of a challenge. It wasn't some guy who just either crumbled or stopped answering the phone. It was a guy who would yell back. I don't see where really where you're going with this. Where I'm going is, I believe Barack Obama is genetically incapable of exercising the power necessary to govern the most complicated nation on earth. That's where I'm going with this. And I think part of the reason he's incapable of doing it is because of racial genetic inferiority. 
Is that clear enough for you? No, you changed the subject again. Wait a second, you asked Caltero me... wasn't the first, like, actual person that, you know, Anonymous had caused trouble for, but the circumstances ended up being significant. They DDoSed his, his website, stuff like that, costing him thousands of dollars, bandwidth fees. We DDoSed him, which is overflowing his server with packets and fake information. And then we kind of trolled him in real life. We sent countless pizzas to his house. We signed him up for escorts on Craigslist. We sent a bunch of pallets of, uh, you know, industrial materials to his house, which he ultimately had to put the bill for. And basically we destroyed his ability to pay for his radio show, and that took him off the Internet. He was super pissed. And, and then they ended up getting some, some real hackers to, to help them out. Like, this wasn't sort of pranks. They actually, like, were able to get into Hal Turner's private servers uh, and his mail servers and, you know, find some interesting emails that he was serving as an FBI informant, uh, which, you know, if you're, uh, you know, a right-wing neo-Nazi, is not a good thing to be. And obviously him being an FBI informant and also his reaction, his sort of douchebaggy reaction to the raids, uh damaged his credibility within the white nationalist scene, you know, which is a shame. Hal Turner's gone. He's been prosecuted by the feds for threatening judges. It wasn't supposed to be different, but it ended up being different. People who observe Anonymous see this group called Anonymous going after this white nationalist and say, oh, hey, look, Anonymous must be some kind of activist organization. So by virtue of those people joining Anonymous, Anonymous becomes more of an activist organization. What follows is a period of, of confusion and, and anger in which you know, the original anonymous people of the sort who want to keep anonymous as this nihilist little, you know, ridiculous group, you know, are upset that now, you know, that the most terrible thing on the internet is now becoming a force for good all of a sudden. Anonymous has never been about getting media attention or getting uh, all of this attention towards it. It means a community, a pretty sometimes insular community that uh, just kind of kept to itself, made jokes and made content. But that was, of course, changed completely. Just turned completely on its head when Chinology started. Anonymous started, began to, have, to become less of just a culture, you know, people who wanted to perform pranks, and more of a, I mean, the internet's first army. I'm Mike Vitale, and my handle is Seth Dude. Now, this is January 2008. Anonymous is strong now. You know, we're not a little dinky fucking group anymore. Like, this is like millions of people worldwide and we're watching. And then Scientology stepped in with a big target on its chest. A video came out of Tom Cruise. It was supposed to be like an internal Scientology video uh, talking about secrets of, of Scientology. Being a Scientologist, when you drive past an accident, it's not like anyone else. As you drive past, you know you have to do something about it because you know you're the only one that can really help. It talks about you're the only one who can stop, you know, bad things from happening. Uh, and so this is kind of widely mocked online. It circulated like wildfire. <laughs> There's nothing part of the way for me. <laughs> it's just... <laughs> People found it humorous and goofy. And the Church of Scientology went into their legal mode and they threatened websites with lawsuits if they didn't pull down the video. Instantly, the Scientologists uh, post uh, a DMCA, Digital Millennium Copyright Act. And this is a way that if you own content, you can go to video sites, uh, upload sites, and have your content pulled when someone uploads it illegally. So Scientology's always at odds with the internet, always trying to legally bully people out of fucking them over on the internet. They always did that. Um, and then here they are trying again, but you know what? Anonymous saw that, and they said, Oh, you guys just fucked around badly. Like, you're trying to censor our internet. You know, like, are you trying to take a joke away from Anonymous? Like, you don't do that. What these people did, in this case, is uh, Greg Housh and these other people, was uh, they decided, you know, we, we can probably harness Anonymous, in this case, and target Scientology. A few Anons, a few people on 4chan posted, hey, we should grab that video and post it on a few other sites. And, um... I, I, was, I was one of the people in that thread talking about it. We got the original source of the video by reaching out to the person behind the accounts and everything. We start posting it. The surprising thing was how fast they were DMCAing them on every site. It looked to us like they must have direct contact with the lawyers and the team who actually pulls videos at all of these sites. Like it was, it was minutes and these things were falling down. We're like, holy crap, that's messed up. What followed was, uh, this is a term called the Barbra Streisand effect. And this video 
as they're attempting to suppress it went everywhere. Like, everywhere you look on the internet, you were gonna stumble upon this video. Actually, Gawker, the site that I worked for, was, I think, the first one to put it on the website, and we got in a huge legal battle with Scientology, who wanted us to take it down. A guy joins the channel, and he says, you should all look at Gawker. So we go over to Gawker, and the strangest thing has happened. This big media company had the video up on their front page and basically had a comment underneath of it that stated very clearly that the FBI would have to come take their servers to get this video taken down. That they were sick of this abuse that was going on. That made us think. What, what, what have we gotten ourselves mixed up in here? Scientology is an interesting target because in some ways it's the perfect inversion of what geeks and hackers value. At so many different levels, science fiction, intellectual property, discourses of freedom, science and technology, it's very proprietary, it's closed. And so in some ways, if you had something like a cultural inversion machine and you stuck geeks and hackers in there, you'd get something that looks a lot like Scientology, so it's quite offensive and there's a real pleasure in attacking your perfect nemesis. We're just p such polar opposites with uh, them being secretive and us hating secrets and, you know, them being so inclusive and us being, you know, anybody could say they're anonymous and most importantly, how fucking self-important they were. They thought they were fucking untouchable. They thought that they were like, you know, like their own little church mafia and shit, you know? <laughs> and anonymous will you know, it's, it's like a plate toy now. You know, we're like, we're gonna make you guys look stupid as shit. What really kind of dared us and set us off about Scientology is specifically the treatment of their critics. Anybody who says anything bad about Scientology is automatically some sort of criminal, some sort of crazy person, a drug addict. It's just that kind of mentality, that kind of, like, if, if anybody says anything bad about you, we're gonna fuck you over in the worst possible way. It, it's just, it resonated like this feeling of disgust within us. That was a big problem. That was the big problem. The censorship aspect of it. The audacity of this cult, this creepy cult, to go into our territory and tell us that we can't post this? No, fuck them. No, it's not gonna happen. And people who knew what Anonymous was to begin with were like, oh my God, Anonymous is gonna go to war with Scientology. This should be really interesting. Especially because it's two weird ass groups. I mean, I, you know, I've been an Anon for a long fucking time. I know Anonymous is really strange. They're re like, they're weird. And the stuff we like is weird. And it's really not mainstream at all. Now you have Scientology. Also really weird. A lot of crazy shit goes down. Anybody on the outside who's seen this is going, Let's watch these two retards fight. Like, a, they're, both their pants are gonna fall down, they're gonna triple, and it's gonna hurt everybody, and it's gonna be hysterical. And what happened was all these people who were geared up, the infrastructure was built to war with other Anons, said, you know what, fuck it. Everybody's gonna get together and pound the fuck out of Scientology. And then that's when 4chan kind of reared into action, really reared into action. And they started to troll the Church of Scientology. And this took the form of pranking the Dianetics hotline, ordering pizzas. Every fax number we get, we're sharing them all. You know, every number we get, we send black pieces of paper on a loop until we sell their ink. I go to call them on the phone and it's busy, busy, busy. You know, and that's their main fucking Dianetics hotline. Their Dianetics 800 number, you can't get through because Anons have completely fucking clogged it and just probably saying stupid shit. The whole idea was just you call them just to keep them on the phone. What's an Elron? How do I Dianetics my face? They were not expecting that and they couldn't handle it. I'm Brian Mettenbrink. I always liked anything technical, mechanical, anything sciencey really. Computers do what you tell them to. They don't all of a sudden start doing weird stuff. And if they do, it's probably your fault. And I always like that, you know, the perfect really in a way. I had just gone to the 4chan just on pure happenstance and I saw a post about the Scientology thing and I started looking up stuff and I'm like, oh, this is actually for a decent cause. I think I'll, you know, do this. You started seeing all the stuff in B, and I saw the stuff in B then. Everyone's going to DDoS Scientology. Everyone's going to bandwidth rape them. Anonymous 
members have, have developed a distributed denial of service attack tool called Low Orbit Ion Cannon, which is taken from a computer game. Low Orbit Ion Cannon is what's called an end game weapon in um, Red Alert. All you had to do was literally follow instructions step by step. I downloaded a program that's free and legal for anyone to download and use. Um, and I followed the instructions and I typed in www.scientology.org and I pushed go. And what it does is it tells scientology.org in this case, it tells them to send their website to my computer about, I think it was 800,000 times in a weekend. And I'm pretty sure I probably took it down myself a couple of times. This tool is low orbit ion cannon, uh, sometimes referred to as like. I am actually not breaking any laws by using this tool against my own computer, 127.0.0.1, which is a non-routable address. But of course, if I were to have attacked one of those other bigger sites out there, uh, I would have severely been breaking the law and would have been doing it in a way that was quite easy to track. What you do is you put in the site, you see that the IP is correct, you make sure that all these settings are good, and you hit the button and off it goes. It felt like you were making a difference, you know, just you yourself, and you didn't even have to leave your home, you know? You just sat at your computer and followed instructions and stood up for what you believe in, so to speak. You made your say in the world, and hopefully it turns out better for it. Yeah, that was some really crazy stuff to watch to be sitting there in front of a monitor and you have just information just flying in front of you and it's this unseeable internet war. And one of the guys said, we need to make a video. We just, we have to make a video. Hello, leaders of Scientology. We are anonymous. When the video came out on January 21st, that was one of the first times that anonymous as a um, culture started referring to itself as anonymous as a movement and declared that it was going to take down and destroy the Church of Scientology, that video probably changed everything. Knowledge is free. We are anonymous. We are legion. We do not forgive. We do not forget. Expect us. It basically looked like if a computer was going to tell you that he was going to beat the shit out of you, this is what it would look like. That one video really galvanized that moment, that moment of innovation, that that's exactly like with that video, internet activism, as it's known today, was born. What the video was saying was, it's over. You're not going to be able to follow people back to their house anymore with impunity. You're not going to be able to just issue a cease and desist letter to any reporter who wants to write some shit about you that you don't like. You know, that's, that's done with. Um, every time you do that, Anonymous is gonna hit you harder. So we made a video named Call to Arms that said, we're going to the streets. Every major city of the world has a Scientology building. Be very wary of the 10th of February. Anonymous invites you to join us in an act of solidarity. Anonymous invites you to take up the banner of free speech, of human rights, of family and freedom. Join us in protest outside of Scientology centers worldwide. And you just see this consensus forming that, it, that it's going to happen. So we made the third video, the code of conduct. Don't bring weapons. Dress accordingly. Cover your faces, because they will try and find out who you are and screw with your life. Rule number 17. Cover your face. This will prevent your identification from videos taken by hostels. Scientology has a history of harassing, stalking, and just generally doing horrible things to its critics. So people needed a way to hide their identities. A lot of people had very legitimate fears. They don't want to be followed home. They don't want to be stalked. They don't want to put their families and themselves in danger. Everyone was going, well, we're going to wear a mask. What's the only fucking mask that we all already know or have a joke about? And it's the Guy Fawkes mask. You see the movie V for Vendetta, you know, the ending scene where everyone's wearing the Guy Fawkes mask. That is very reminiscent of what Anonymous thinks Anonymous is. wanted to represent anonymity in some way when it moved into real life. I think that the Guy Fox mask was one of the most natural things to happen. It is the idea that none of us are as cruel as all of us. You have this massive crowd of people who are anonymous that is going to fight against a bigger thing and win. Even after watching the video, it's like, yeah, this is great, but who's actually going to do it? Who's going to... Who's gonna step up? Are people actually gonna get out of their house? Like, the, like, and I guess we were really affected by the stereotype of 
of that whole community that are being internet nerds, that are too, too afraid to leave their mom's basements. I figured maybe 50 nerds from every city somewhere might show up and wear their masks at a building for a while and leave. No one thought that they were going to come out. This is me on the way there. I haven't slept. I'm very fucking tired. And I remember going to the park that day, and it's really fucking early in the morning, which I thought was a bad idea. Um, and I'm, I'm smoking a cigarette, and I'm looking around like, where the fuck is everybody? There's like, there's nobody here. So here I am, sitting in Bryant Park. Waiting for the other announcer to show up. I remember thinking like, oh fuck, like, am I gonna be the only one in the park? Am I gonna walk to Scientology with fucking six or seven people? Which totally defeats the entire purpose of this because now they could single me out, you know? Then I, actually, I get up and I start walking around and I see there's a lot of green balloons over there for some reason. On the other side of the park, there was like fucking 200 people. There was Guy Fawkes masks everywhere. And I'm like, holy shit, this is huge. There's a, a fucking lot of us. That's pretty good. I had no idea how many Anons there were until we started moving. <laughs> and it just fucking got bigger. I remember walking through Times Square and everybody in Times Square was in Anon. Like, and you know, this is like a fucking thousand person per like fucking minute foot traffic area. And everywhere I'm looking, I'm seeing fucking Anon symbols. It was fucking wild. It was really wild. <laughs> this is our fucking race. Hell yeah! Do we start getting numbers in? And Sydney. We're thinking that it's going to be 50 people. And before 10 a.m., before even time, there's already 50 people there. And there's still streams of people walking down the street. A couple hours into it, you know, because I didn't go to bed until one in the morning, you know, you're looking at Sydney as, uh, wow, there's 250 people in Sydney. The cops are estimating higher than that um, for their reports. What, what just happened? Adelaide, Perth, and Melbourne happened. And you know, over 200 at each of them. And we, we nearly broke a thousand leaving Australia. Now the next protest was Tel Aviv, which had actually gotten its first Scientology building a week before this. There were Palestinians and Israelis at this protest, both holding their flags. And at one point they actually switched flags and held up each other's flags and whatnot. It was awesome to see. I call our guy in London, uh, Britain on, and I say, hey, uh, what's going on there? And he's like, did you just get out of bed? I said, yeah, I haven't even turned on the computer. I just figured I'd call you. And he said, we've got 600 people, and the cops are really, really mad at me. All the major cities were having hundreds of people come out. It's massive. Clearwater had like 300 people. I don't think anyone beat out LA. I think LA had over 1,000 people. We are major! We are major! The thing that happened was something completely different, and hundreds and hundreds of people from every city just swarmed the streets. It was kind of overwhelming, a little even scary, but scary in a good way. Soon, you know, we're at around the 10,000 mark, you know, and we were joking the whole time, over 9,000, you know, one of those memes. It was too surreal. It was not believable. You go by what name? We are anonymous. It was very empowering especially after people saw the thousands of people showing up. This was it. We owned the world at that point. You've got lolcats, and you've got rickrolling. You've got all these other things that Anonymous has been involved in. Then, you know, take us a month later, and, you know, 10,000 people were just in the streets. And uh, in every major country in the world, in every major city in the world. And what the hell just happened? What, what, what changed? You know, who flipped the switch? The world looked very different to me at that point. We all met each other. The idea of an Anon is you're fucking alone until you get to 4chan, you know, and then these people all think like you, you know? Then all of a sudden, you're not alone. Um, you are with fucking 500 others, you know? They all know the same jokes as you. Um, they all have, clearly, have similar interests as you. Here's your culture. <laughs> you meet your own people, finally. 
immediately you felt like you were at home. If you were an Anon, you were at home. We all like spent years in the same place, looking at the same pictures, laughing at the same jokes. And we pretty much were already friends, even though we've never ever met. It was very happy. It's perhaps a little surprising. It's not just preteens or teenagers. There's a, f a far more even mix of males and females than you would imagine otherwise. Everyone always figured Anonymous was a very male, you know, thing, yeah. but it wasn't like that at all, at all. There's some fucking hot girls come through. <laughs> like, there's some like really, like, you'd be surprised. And you know, there were a lot of, a lot of, you know, these so-called, you know, guys who weren't socially good. They were very awkward. They, they still lived at home at 23, half of them virgins. And I'll tell you the amount of those people who got laid from these protests happening is in the thousands that would not have uh, for years probably. And that's why those protests were so important. It was a chance to finally meet other people that were previously anonymous and unknown. And hence it was the moment of the end of their anonymity. Scientology, they kind of fought back, so to speak. They posted stuff online. While claiming they are peaceful, in less than three weeks, anonymous members made or encouraged 8,139 harassing or threatening phone calls, 3.6 million malicious emails, 141 million hits against church websites, 10 acts of vandalism, 22 bomb threats, and eight death threats against members and officials of the Church of Scientology. They basically antagonized, really, is what they did, which is really one of the things they're great at. They wanted to find me. Um, they did. They hired PIs. They started taking pictures of us, threatening to sue us. People were getting followed. People were getting followed home. It would be a regular thing for someone to say, oh, I had to... I had to lose someone on the subway. I saw someone from the Scientology Center and, and they were following me. They would follow us to our houses, try to intimidate us, send us uh, cease and desist letters. They had a PI hand deliver a cease and desist letter from a very expensive lawyer. It was a double message there. You know, it was a, hey, we know where you live and we know your name and here's something from our lawyer. Just these uh, old tactics that they used to fight the activism they faced before the internet just completely, were completely ineffective against Chinology. You know, most of the people who received them actually framed them and put them on their wall. I've, I've seen multiple of them framed and put on the wall. Mine's sitting in my closet somewhere in a box. They don't care to actually use the legal system to get you thrown in jail. They care to use the legal system to get you to stop. I did the whole low orbit ion cannon stuff and then pretty much just went about my life after that for probably, see, I think it's six months, and then they, the FBI showed up here at my parents' house where I wasn't um, looking for me. Two men got out of the car and took their, their jackets, took their jackets off and laid their guns on the front seat and um, came up to ask us if Brian was home and... Um, explained that they were the FBI and they were looking for Brian and I've never been so scared. And then my parents directed them to uh, where I was living um, and they showed up and said, Let, I'd like to have a friendly conversation with you and I had the worst friendly conversation of my life. And we sat down at my dining room table and they just started asking me questions and, I've, and I'm, I'm trying to figure out what they're here for because I have no idea. Um, and they eventually started asking me questions about Anonymous. I was scared to death. I mean, my son is could, is looking at five years in jail and a $100,000 fine. You know, I had no idea that it was any sort of this big of a crime to do what I did. I thought it was the kind of slap on a wrist, $200 fine type crime. Um, so I actually told them that I did it at that point. Um, then it went from there. But yeah. I would have never ever believed that the maximum punishment for this was five years in prison. It was it was a very eye-opening experience. Uh, I had a little bit of trouble accepting it, knowing that I could go to prison for five years. 
um, knowing that I would be in prison from age 20 to 25 for this, you know, I thought that was a little bit extreme. I tell people it would be different if they drank and drove and killed somebody. But he didn't do that. It's, it's hard to deal with, harder to deal with. Because he didn't do that. He just pushed a button on his computer and as he explained it to me at the time, it was like pushing the refresh button over and over and over and over 800,000 times. And it seems like such a little thing. I did the second most damage is what Scientology said. I did, I sent the second most out of everybody. So I got the maximum for my category, which was one year in prison and one year supervised release. I think, you know, the way I feel is for what I did was one of the most like lopsided punishments I've ever like read about or heard of. Yeah, I think it's a uh, ridiculous, especially the the year supervised release where I can't touch a computer for a year. I'm not sure what that's supposed to solve except make my life, life difficult. So that computer behind me back there, I, I could go back to prison if I went over and touched it. Because I can't knowingly associate with members of Anonymous. They just made a big deal about Scientology as a religion and that this is America and you can believe in whatever you want to believe. And they, I'm pretty sure they actually compared me to like the KKK and the Nazis yeah. and stuff in the courtroom. Yeah. It's, it's a completely wow. different yeah. issue. I'm very proud of what he did. He stood up for what he believed in, but that was never, ever mentioned. I never would even dream of hurting anybody. You know, it's just not me. Prior to Anonymous, critics of the church still had to be very, very careful because of the aggressive lawsuits that were launched against academics, journalists, and other critics. I would say that era is over. And Anonymous, more than any other sort of intervention, is probably responsible for that change. This actually caused a decent rift in Anonymous. There was one big group, significant group of people who would say, this chinology stuff, it's, it's cancer, it's awful, it's bad. It's, it's just bringing attention to us that we don't want. The trolling isn't happening, we're not getting our jollies. Like, now this is all really serious and moral and somber. And like, well, you know, that's not what I signed up for, that kind of thing. And then there are the people who were on the other side who are going, well, I only signed up for the serious and somber. You guys, go away. This is, this is, you know, and, you know, there became this very fierce clash of ideologies, and it was alien to us. They decided, uh, in their own words, which I, I, I was privy to because it was told to me, stop ruining our bad name. So to make Anonymous look bad, they go off and they post uh, animated GIFs, uh, animated images to epilepsy forums that are black and white just strobing really quickly. So any of the epilepsy people on these support forums see it and they fall off their chairs, you know, in seizure. You start hearing this term moral fag. If you're not out there making epileptics have seizures, then you're doing it wrong. So you're a moral fag. Which is what I am, a moral fag. Those who want to use anonymous as, you know, as a tool for, for good in some sense. Uh, rather than just doing what we used to do, which is to screw with video games. One Anon said it well once. There is no leader. Their ops have momentary leaders, de facto leaders. I like to describe this with the picture of a bird swarm. Everybody's flying very, very quiet. Suddenly, one bird flies into the other direction and the mass fly into the same direction following that person. It's totally okay to say, I'm sorry, I don't take part. When Shonology was running full force, it was like a kid stretching for the first time and actually seeing the real power. It's the teenage period actually, trying, um, yeah, Operation Titstorm. Operation Titstorm. Australia over the past couple of years has been relatively malignant in their attitude towards internet freedom compared to other Western countries. A guy named Tux wanted to attack the Australian government 
uh, in retaliation for upcoming internet censorship laws. And one of them involved uh, banning pornography with women with small breasts for some reason. Um, so that was the first time that Anonymous went up against the government. When they, they DDoSed and took down several government sites, it was the first time that Anonymous uh, was going up against a state. If you had asked me all throughout 2008 and most of 2009, is the politics of Anonymous always going to be sutured and hinged to the Church of Scientology? I would have said yes. And it became unsutured, unhinged, when a different political wing was born in 2010. The Motion Picture Association had hired an Indian software firm to DDoS the Pirate Bay. And Anonymous coming out of 4chan, DDoS, the Motion Picture Association of America, as well as then other groups like the Recording Industry Association. Of it angered people for a lot of different reasons. I mean, obviously one of the reasons was that they were attempting to censor the internet. Um, another of the reasons, though, was that, you know, people in Anonymous had been arrested before for taking part in such attacks, um, say on the Church of Scientology and other targets that there had been before. I think there was a big sense of the hypocrisy in this was the moment a kind of networked kind of architecture was born where there was a different node that was unrelated. Some people crossed over and they were connected by aesthetics and by ethics, and yet this was a different ship that was sailing. It is our task to find secret abusive plans and expose them where they can be opposed before they're implemented. The interesting thing about someone like Assange is that he actually also sprang from you know, a, a, a hacker culture. It's a mentality of spreading information. Julian was Mendax. He was the greatest hacker that ever walked the face of the Earth when I was a kid. I mean, they, they rumored he could move satellites around in space by hacking into NASA. I mean, I mean, you know, it probably, maybe it never happened, but I mean, it was, you know, it was a myth that kept young kids like me wanting to, like, you know, plug a computer into a modem and see if I can move some satellites around. WikiLeaks is an instantiation of the hacker ethos. Truth wants to be free, and we want to liberate it. WikiLeaks release a huge trove of diplomatic cables. There was a lot of controversy from every quarter of society. The WikiLeaks website released nearly 400,000 secret U.S. files on the Iraq war late today. It was the largest leak of classified U.S. files in history. The diplomatic cables show the U.S. is spying on its allies. Lots of things which were understood in private and may have been uh, not even talked about explicitly. Suddenly they're out there in the cold light of day and it's going to make some governments and some individuals very uncomfortable. He was showing the world a glimpse of how, you know, the powerful elite actually work. At least to some extent. I mean, these are, these are fairly low-level diplomats sending messages back and forth. But it's a side of government you, you hardly ever see. And it's, it's pretty eye-opening. And, you know, once it's out, it's out. I, I think information wants to be free. But let's, let's look at it. Let's analyze it. It's important that we know such stuff. It's important that we know what our governments do. And if they don't tell us, then somebody has to. There was one particular moment that really sparked the fire. And this was when PayPal, MasterCard, and Amazon pulled services for WikiLeaks. So all of a sudden, there's no way to actually like process donations to, to WikiLeaks. And then people went and found like neo-Nazi groups Visa and MasterCard were perfectly fine with you being able to, like, you know, PayPal, being able to, like, make donations to them. But WikiLeaks, no. You can pay the KKK, you can donate money to the Westboro Baptist Church with your PayPal and your fucking MasterCard, but you can't give any money to WikiLeaks. And I think WikiLeaks is doing a good thing. It's just a total hypocrisy. They, they got their little fucking banking mafia to fuck, you know, WikiLeaks over. People were incredibly angry. And there was a, a real sense of rage. There was, I think there was a sense that WikiLeaks was exposing the lies that the government had told to the people and that the government was desperately trying to make sure that those lies weren't exposed. And um, there was just an intense, I can only call it fury. If you're a hacker, it's one of those John F. Kennedy was shot moments. Not to actually compare it to that, but it's one of those moments you always remember where, exactly where you were when you heard it. I mean, I just really never dreamed that they would have the audacity 
and anonymous, very quickly moves into an attack mode. Anonymous DOS people, they were pissed. Cyber protests, sit-ins, however you want to look at it. DDoS is a tool that is a, a, a big giant, it's like driving a finish nail in with a sledgehammer. The numbers of participants were massive, massive. And they manage over the course of a couple of days to disable the websites of MasterCard and PayPal. It was like watching the hack magician finally get a trick right, because you're not expecting it, and then it's magnificent. It was beautiful. Um, <laughs> Because what you had is people finally stood up for something. How long has it been since we had a, a, a huge, really relevant protest? I'm not talking Tea Party, I want to bring my guns in public. I'm talking, uh, I'm talking 10,000 angry people said, this is not right and I want to do something about it. Soon after, January 2nd, I believe, WikiLeaks was blocked in Tunisia. And Anonymous got wind of that. They then intervened, at first solely for the purposes of like stopping the kind of censorship that was happening. They did some DDoSing. And this was a time period where they were getting involved with what I would call non internet -y social movements and building lines of solidarity. My name's Pete Fine. You can call me an internaut or a hacktivist. Telecomics is an ad hoc cluster of volunteer net activists um, who have spent much of the last year trying to keep the internet running in the Middle East. During that time, we saw the Tunisian government not only censoring and filtering the internet, but also doing some kind of technical trickery to steal people's Facebook passwords and delete their posts and see who was posting what and, you know, fake, fake posts, stuff like that. Some Tunisian hackers came to us. They were members of Anonymous, and I didn't even know we had members of Anonymous in Tunisia, so it was a shock to me. Um, and they had some, uh, they had the keys to some, some parts of the kingdom, so to speak, with, when it came to the dictator in Tunisia. We went in on behalf of those Tunisian Anons, and we helped them get that and extract it, and, and then it went to WikiLeaks. The Tunisians overthrew Ben Ali, who was kind of a repressive dictator. A revolution that was facilitated by, by the internet, uh, by Facebook, and, and by Twitter. Not caused by it, I mean, 50 years of dictatorship has caused, caused the Arab Spring. Um, but the internet has certainly been helping. There's a video where they are thanking us for being involved, holding up a mask, saying we were the only one who stood by their side. For me, it was awesome to hear that and to feel the connection. The same group of hackers that target anti-WikiLeaks sites have now turned their attention to Egypt. In kind of the lead up to the Egyptian revolution, we would tweet on people's behalf. We would get people from Egypt who were unable to access Twitter on their own on our IRC network. And we would take reports from them and tweet them out using, using our account to kind of help them get the word out about what they were experiencing. Some of this shit is personal. And one of the things about the movement as a whole, when Egypt rolled around, is that Egypt broke us emotionally. Watching in real time with live feeds that we helped set up, Egyptians get massacred with machine guns. It was different, and I have never in cyber activism wept before. It's never bothered me like that. It's never been able to touch me the way Egypt touched me. It was fucked up that we were watching people killed for no reason other than leaving their homes, that these people had every right to freedom, that they had every right to choose their government. And then January 27th, January 28th rolls around, and the Egyptian government starts shutting down the internet. I mean, just, just for the whole country, the whole country. There's this fantastic traffic graph that you can see the traffic coming out of Egypt, and it looks like, you know, like this. Like this. Just totally stops. 
And we were just shocked. And we were just like, what the fuck? Like, what the fuck? To think that a country would completely cut itself off as much as it was able to from the outside world was pretty unthinkable. You know, we know, we know bad things go on in the dark places. And suddenly it got quiet. I remember that somehow burned into my brain that uh, first Twitter was flooded and suddenly everything was quiet. That's the kind of thing that could start riots. I think when Mubarak did what he did, I think it really upset people here uh, as well as in the Middle East. I put myself in their place and I, I, I found myself in a desert of nothingness because he just wiped out everything that my world incorporated. That just showed me and everybody else that the same thing can happen at any time, at anywhere, in any government. Anonymous and the people on the internet stood up and said, go fuck yourself. You wanna shut down their internet? Fine. The people on the internet will show them how to turn it back on. It's almost like the internet as an actual pain. It's like the internet is a living pain. But it's, it's like a conscious thing that gets up and says, no, you can't do that. Uh, a lot of my friends helped with encryption, helped people on the ground in those countries validate SSL keys and certificates, and really showed them how to subvert their government and, and become free. And then telecomics started to tweet connections to the internet, dial up connections. In Egypt, the care package we put together included some kind of our comms information, the ham radio and dial modem uh, details. In total, we helped coordinate and run about 500 dial up modem lines. We also Googled up treatments for tear gas and other kind of basic medical treatment and found folks who could translate that into Arabic. Sort of put this together in a nice one page PDF and fax, and off it goes. I think the most effective thing was shutting down government websites. We're taking your uh, dictator's web pages down. It is cyber warfare at that point. When you're dealing with a dictator like that that's killing people, all the gloves are off. We are going to not just take your websites offline. We are going to destroy your every communications. We are going to wreck you like a, like a nation state would wreck you. In Cairo, Egypt, the crowds are shouting and screaming. President Hosni Mubarak has decided to step down from the office of President of the Republic. When Mubarak left, it was a hell yeah moment. Can rise up. People can make a change, and, and I think for for a lot of people in America, it was the first time they had seen people rise up and take down their government and say, "We're sick of this shit. We're sick of the oppression. We're sick of living as slaves to your power." We had Egyptians come thank us as we're doing this stuff, and I said to them, "Like, look, you guys just get our back if stuff goes down here." Although it was awesome and it was one part we were fighting for, for me it was quite clear that it's not the end of the story, that it's not uh, suddenly changing into rainbows and nine cats or whatever, but that we now have to watch even more. The FBI is now investigating Anonymous, a loose collection of rogue, tech-savvy hackers credited with bringing down the websites of MasterCard and Visa last December. So there were 40 raids back then. They seized computers, cell phones, those kind of technical apparatus, sometimes including from in the case of, you know, 19-year-old girl with their family, it took their parents' stuff, too. There's always been a sort of cat-and-mouse dynamic, not just in relation to the feds, but also to these sort of groups that have appointed themselves as guardians of the republic, and there's groups called, like, Backtrace Security, which is made up of a couple of deranged people who, uh, for, I think, for personal reasons, have uh, grievances against Anonymous. I've been threatened by people who are uh, former Secret Service agents who now run private security companies. Suddenly, on February 5th, a Financial Times article comes out that, that we all see. 
Uh, it's quoting this guy named Aaron Barr, who's the, who's the CEO of HP Gary Federal, which is an intelligence contractor. And Aaron Barr is telling his Financial Times journalist, Joseph Men that he's been secretly monitoring the Anonop server where all this is going on and has done so for several weeks and using his own custom brand of information operations techniques has managed to identify the alleged leadership of Anonymous including 25 quote lieutenants unquote some sort. We have to see this document. Everyone wants to know. We don't need to destroy him. We don't need to destroy his company. We just need to see the document and we'll decide what comes next after looking at the document. So they get it. It, it was unbelievably easy to get into that network. And my name was on there as a screen name. And uh, Greg Hausch was listed there by a screen name. The fact of the matter is what he told Financial Times was everything he told them was demonstrably untrue. And very much hilariously so. He had to be shut up. It had to be proven to the world that this guy was a retard and that his information was in no way valid. Now to put that in hacker terms, anonymous is a hornet's nest. And Barr said, I'm gonna stick my penis in that thing. <laughs> And in a mere 24 hours, he was owned, pwned completely by a small group of participants who basically went on a hacking rampage. Faster than you can say, get these hornets off my penis. <laughs> Anonymous took down Barr's website, stole his emails, deleted the company's backup data, trashed his Twitter account, and remotely wiped his iPad. <laughs> And he had just reached the Hammam High level on Angry Birds. <laughs> the H.B. Gary hack brought about 70,000 emails. Probably the most important ones had to do with a proposal that H.B. Gary had already formulated. It was packaged up as a nice PowerPoint presentation. Kind of act as privatized agent provocateurs, where they were going to discredit WikiLeaks H.P. Gary was proposing submitting fake documents to WikiLeaks, and then when discovered as fake, the error could be called out and right. it would discredit WikiLeaks. Right. So, um, so there's a lot of like specifics I can't talk about. So let me try to answer that though in a, in a in a general sense. Um, well, first of all, I'm. It's probably no surprise to anybody. I'm not a big fan of WikiLeaks. I think that uh, the broad um, purpose of trying to get as much information, proprietary or classified information for the government, expose that is an extremely destructive and dangerous purpose. As Julian Assange had uh, a few months before noted that they had information on a major bank showing wrongdoing and Bank of America uh, somehow knew it was them. And the proposals involved for, for Bank of America and the WikiLeaks problem, they entailed conducting information war uh, on WikiLeaks and its supporters, creating dissension within WikiLeaks, um, DDoS attacks. You, you also wanted to launch cyber attacks on WikiLeaks infrastructure to get information on document submitters. Well, one thing I guess I want to make sure is, is clear is, um, you know, n none of those activities had actually occurred. You know, there's in business, there's, um, you know, when you, when you start proposing or thinking about an idea, there's a brainstorming phase. And somebody says, well, what if, you know, what could we do? What's theoretically possible? Well, still, this was an idea. This was proposed. This was something that you thought about. Right. They also wanted to go on a campaign kind of targeting Glenn Greenwald, who's a reporter for Salon, who's an outspoken kind of critic of the government and supporter of WikiLeaks. It seems like you're trying to attack a journalist here. Yeah, and I, you know, I don't want to talk too much more about Glenn Greenwald, but other than, you know, what I previously said is, it, you know, the, there was never an intent to attack uh, uh, journalists, um, not on my part, you know, I, you know, nor, I guess I should say, gen, I should generalize that and to say that, you know, I, I would never just outwardly attack a journalist, other than if I felt that there was a journalist in my mind that was acting uh, unethically, that, you know, that, is um, a, a, that's a um, fair game for having a public discussion about. They were walking a very fine ethical line at points, and in many cases, the, the mass opinion is, no, they stepped well past it. I will not support broad theft of, of, of information released to the public, because that's nothing but destructive.
If somebody has information that's been stolen from them, and um, you know whether or not you know WikiLeaks encouraged the theft of that, or or whether or not it was just put in their lap, still they're they're threatening to release the information that is the private property of another organization. So um, the, your choices are to just allow that to happen, or to try to stop it. How offensive is too offensive? You know, we've certainly seen a lot of strategy coming out of governments across the world now saying, you know, basically publicly admitting that they need to become, they need to develop better offensive strategies uh, in cybersecurity because defense in, in, as, as a whole it isn't enough. It, it never is enough. Some of the most important things that have been, uh, have had the most far-reaching influence and have been the most important in terms of what's been discovered, not just by anonymous, by, but by the media in the aftermath, is the result of hacking. That information can't be obtained by the traditional journalistic process, or it can't be obtained or won't be obtained by a congressional committee or a federal oversight committee. Uh, for the most part, that information has to be you know, obtained by hackers. After this had happened, although only a small number of people had participated, the collective mood was exuberance within Anonymous. It was a kind of moment of the lulls being recharged, which people were excited about because people felt like the lulls had been running low during the Middle Eastern protests. And so it was a moment of great triumphalism within Anonymous. Anonymous is currently targeting Sony's website. We are doing this because Sony is currently suing people for making features the PlayStation originally had available to the public. It started off as a denial of service attacks, but then someone really broke into the PlayStation network and stole all the user accounts and all the credit card information. Sony has confirmed that hackers broke into its PlayStation network, exposing the personal information of up to 77 million users worldwide. Anonymous basically bent Sony over and had their way with them. And the consumers were the ones that also got hurt in the process. Two months of people not being able to use the PlayStations, that actually had real hardcore end user impact. If they break into a site and they pull back customer information, do they really need to disclose 100,000 customers? No. What they're doing could be done a lot better. Uh, and when I say by better, I mean better for the end user, for the customers, while still making a point. And then, kind of seemingly out of the blue, there was something by the name Lulsec that sailed into the seas. The Lulsec, is, it's a sort of a, a group of a couple people, mostly from Anonymous, who, large part with the same, same people who act HB Gary. And they decided to form this little group and uh, just carry on uh, operations sort of outside the purview of Anonymous for a while. They kept whatever they wanted, they released whatever they wanted. It's almost like they had no rules. They just said, this is what we're going to do. We're going to stir up the court. We're going to make some trouble. We're going to make some waves. And they did. What they did was they put on a play, not high arts, not lowbrow either. It wasn't particularly, let's just say, grotesque. Their symbol was a kind of cartoon caricature of the Monopoly man with a monocle and a cigarette. There was a lot of iconography of boats and ships, pirate motifs, and then, of course, a cat. Chaos and mayhem. Right now, it's probably one of the right things to do. Some of the things Lulsec did in the court of public opinion were less noble. Private citizens were being um, doxxed or the credit card numbers that could have been redacted. You could still make your point without actually you know, giving up people's personal details. So um, the court of public opinion um, swayed that Lulsec had crossed lines that maybe the previous manifestations had not. Collateral damage such as the release of, uh, of docs and people's personal information who are just caught in the crossfire, really, of an anonymous confrontation uh, is something that a lot of anons uh, don't really support. There was a lot of, you know, um, infighting about it because uh, their, their way, you know, wasn't really our way. We will not attack the media. PBS's Frontline uh, runs a, you know, a documentary on, uh, mainly focused on Bradley Manning, um, you know, the alleged leaker to, to WikiLeaks. 
And this for a lot of Bradley Manning supporters didn't like it. They, they thought the felt it was a little too psychologizing, right? It was like looking a little bit more like his personal life than like why it is he leaked the documents and what the documents actually meant. They hacked a website putting a story that Tupac and Biggie had kind of escaped the world of celebrity fame and attention and retired quietly and discreetly in New Zealand. Also, when they attacked PBS, um, you know, that, that, that gave me the creeps, you know. As a journalist, I'm not too thrilled with the idea of someone judging that we don't like you to write that. We don't like your reporting, so we're going to shut down your website. I'm, un I'm uncomfortable with that. It could be me, and I could be writing something about a group that they didn't like. And, you know, uh, hey, I, I'm happy to, to sit and talk with them about it, but, uh, you know, don't shut my website down. This is obviously about freedom of speech, so attacking the press would be, uh, um, would sort of be a bit of a contradiction. Uh, so people have said, well, we shouldn't do that. Uh, and obviously, Lodzak uh, had a completely different agenda, so they had no problem doing it. They sort of saw themselves going out there, breaking into like anything, everything, governments, corporations, police departments. Largely for the, for the same reasons Anonymous would. You know, they went after Arizona for um, immigration policy. 50-day run, causing mayhem, havoc, uh, and then, you know, ended it. The computer hacking group, Lult Security, has announced it's disbanding, saying it had achieved its mission to disrupt government and corporate organizations for fun. I call this whole thing the rise of the chaotic actor. It's not like the first time we've had hacktivism, but we're definitely seeing like a renaissance in it. And chaotic could be chaotic good, neutral or evil. You know, if you go back to the old Dungeons and Dragons charts. And some people see anon ops initially, and let's stick with anonymous, as chaotic good. They saw Operation Payback or they saw attacking Scientology, and they say that's good. It's like Robin Hood, right? Chaotic good. Outside the system, but doing something good. Other people saw Anon as chaotic evil, like the Joker. They just want to see the world burn and doing potentially irreparable damage. And the truth is, yes, it's, it's the entire column of chaotic. Sixteen people were arrested today, but dozens of FBI agents targeted alleged members of the loose-knit hacking group. Armed with search warrants, agents hit six homes in New York, along with locations across the country. The people arrested yesterday were suspected of attacking PayPal's website after the company shut off payments to WikiLeaks. Defenders of the hackers say they're merely engaged in civil protest, but FBI officials worry the disruptive cyber attacks could move in a more dangerous direction. So the FBI shows up at 6 in the morning and it was really obnoxious. And I remember being frustrated and angry because there was nothing that I had done that would have justified an FBI search warrant. They came and uh, guns blazing and all this other good stuff, busted down the door. I immediately just dropped down on the floor, 180, didn't want nothing. I wasn't trying to fight nobody. Theory of the case is they were, you know, they, they flooded, quote unquote, a number of people flooded access to PayPal, thereby creating economic distress to a protected corporation. End of story. This isn't a, this is not a case involving identity theft, involving outing emails, involving violating privilege, involving theft of services, involving, you know, shutting down business. It is a pure case of internet or cyber sit-ins. I think when Barack Obama gets on television and says, flood the switchboard, shut down the Republicans, send the message, that's, that's legal. And even if you accept what the theory of this prosecution is, it's no different. This is an electronic sit-in at its finest. If you're a pedophile, the average is 11 years. If you're a computer hacker, the average is 15. And I think that's ridiculous. So, <laughs> yeah. I mean, no, that's... That's ridiculous. I mean, you can go molest children and get less of a sentence than you would for uh, breaking into someone's phone. If you, even if you accept what the government is saying is true, what is important is that people are participating in the process. It is very much the process. It is sitting in an encounter in Selma, Alabama 
500 freedom riders refusing to allow people to go and sit in at a segregated lunch counter. They write books about that stuff. It is demonstrating in a street corner saying no to a war. It's just a different, it's, 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 it's just a different vehicle. It's the same results. For nine months I ran from my indictment. But they, they, they busted me, I went to jail, I bonded out. And then I held the news conference, you know, because uh, as risky as that was and against my lawyer's advice, I wanted the world to know some fucking things about what's going on. I didn't want the feds to have the only voice in the dialogue. This document alleges that I am the notorious hacker activist known to the world as Commander X. I am. The indictment further alleges that I am in association with the global internet freedom movement known as Anonymous. And I say yes. I am immensely proud, humbled to the core, to be a part of the idea called Anonymous. You know, I, I would never compare myself to people like Gandhi or Dr. Martin Luther King, but they were one person and they were willing to go out and change the world. And their messages live on every day through everybody. And to not take the chance of having something like that to do is foolish. I only wish we we had 50 million Mercedes hey, I feel a lot more comfortable as a guy getting towards the tail end of his career if there were more Mercedes. There's always going to be legal consequence when you decide to break the law. That comes with the territory. And it would be naive not to expect that. The question is whether the punishment will be proportional to the crime. And I suspect it might not be. People will be watching very closely to see how these cases proceed, on what grounds, and whether there's any room during the trials to think, especially of the denial of service attacks, as a legitimate form of protest. So much of our lives are now configured, at least in part, on the internet. So we better start thinking about how we claim parts of the internet as spaces that we can also protest in. This is the point in history at which you decide whether or not protesting is possible online. You can stand up and you can say freedom of speech extends to online. We have the right to not be monitored by our government because of our opinions. It's up to you. You're in the position of Huck Finn. Do you remember Huck Finn at the end of the book? He's told he's got to take that slave and give it back. Two things will happen if he doesn't. One, legally, he'll go to jail, because Jim is property. Two, he'll be damned eternally and burned in hellfire, because he's in an evangelical environment in Missouri. And Huck smokes his corn cob pipe all night and thinks about it. And next morning he says, well, damn it, I'll go to hell then. In other words, he discovered that in order to be an expert at ethics, you had to transcend the legal and sanctioned religious uh, appropriate truths of the day in order to access the meta-truth of both legality and righteousness. Well, hackers see themselves as Huck putting down that corn cob pipe and saying, all right, I'll go to jail. All right, I'll go to hell, but I'm going to do the right thing. Um, I suppose the question you, you really want to ask is, would I do it again? Um, and honestly, after thinking about it, I felt that I did what was right. I, have a, I had a belief, I still do, that what I did was the right thing. And hopefully someone got some good out of it. You know, I'd love to think that maybe I stopped someone from joining a cult, you know. Probably wouldn't tell on myself next time, but you know, I don't think I would have changed a single thing other than the whole talking to the FBI thing. Just that little yeah, just, just the, just the just little detail that, that kind of changed everything, yeah. I'm angry. Um, occasionally I have small breakdown moments of terror, <laughs> but I haven't stopped believing what I believed. I haven't stopped wanting to fight. I haven't stopped caring. I don't think this whole issue is a technical hacking thing. This is more about 
human philosophy and psychology, what's motivating us, why is there so much unrest or disenfranchisement or anger that would lead people to want to take matters in their own hands and join these. Whether you think it's bad or not is irrelevant. It's not going away. I have stood upon the mountaintop known as Anonymous and looked down on a, a, a world inflamed with revolution. What can you say? Your spine tingles when you're at the cusp of history. When you're surfing, you know, the waves of history, your, your spine tingles. There's a lot of people in Anonymous who, who, who feel very deeply and very sincerely about their contribution towards democracy around the world. And I think that's, that's one of the main things that I'm most proud of about Anonymous. There are things that I'm not proud of about Anonymous, but, the, but we stand against censorship and we stand against oppressive governments, even our own. It's a very noble thing. If you have power in real life and you have money in real life, you know, it doesn't fucking matter on the internet. What matters on the internet is your actual ideas you know, how smart you are, the quality of you. And when certain organizations, you know, they want to extend their real life power onto the internet, it's not gonna fucking take because of Anonymous. And history teaches us that change simply doesn't come with flowers. It doesn't work. If they say I'm a criminal, damn, well, then I will be one. Anonymous is um, evolving thing. It's like a phoenix. It might occasionally catch fire and burn to the ground, but it'll be reborn from ashes. It'll be reborn stronger. I don't care if you're a Democrat or a Republican or an Independent or if you like Ron Paul or if you worship pigeons or Scientology or if you're Catholic or atheist or Methodist, I don't care about that. Your opinion matters. I don't care if I disagree with it. I don't care if I hate your guts. Your opinion matters.